Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Room Week in Review for April 7, 2024. Today we're talking with Dr. Anna Garabedian. Welcome to the show, Anna. Welcome, Anna. Thank you very much. Welcome. So let's talk a little bit about this trilateral meeting on April 5 between the US, the EU, and Armenia. Pashinyan met with Anthony Blinken and Ursula von der Leyen on Friday, and agreements were signed for a combined $350 million aid package aimed at the so-called resilience of the Armenian economy or the resilience of Armenia. This meeting was very loudly denounced by Azerbaijan's Aliyev, as well as the Russian MFA, despite assurances on the part of the participants that the talks were not aimed or against Azerbaijan or Russia. Both Blinken and von der Leyen called Aliyev and emphasized that no Armenian security issues were being discussed. But these assurances didn't correspond to their perceptions. And after the meeting, Aliyev escalated tensions along the Armenian-Azerbaijani borders with shootings along the border. Anna, what was the purpose of this meeting? And what does Armenia's resilience really mean? The purpose of the meeting, we can describe the purpose of the meeting for Armenia in general, for the... Uh, Western partners of Armenia and for Pashinyan personally. Because as we know, the main uh, issue of Pashinyan is now to show that uh, West supports him and to use this uh, meeting and other announcements for, from the West uh, to increase his ratings inside the country because the latest the polls showed that his rating is very, very down. And uh, that's why he has some problems with the society's uh, support of his government and his policy. And uh, the, he and his uh, party are uh, actively using this meeting for making some PR company for uh, their government. That's why uh, they straight before the meeting, like uh, two hours before meeting, we had some article on the website of Pashinyan. And in the article, uh, he, he said that it was not by uh, the... Author wasn't mentioned, but everyone understood that it was his article where he was speaking that in the society there are very high expectations from this meeting, but they are higher than we can have during this meeting. That's why it's important to have realistic expectations. And yes. it showed that he had some feeling that maybe the results of the meeting will not make the necessary PR and the necessary impact on the society that he wanted to have. The website that you mentioned, is it, it was it the official prime minister's website or was it Armenia Times? It was, Times. it was Arm Times. It was Arm Times, Times yeah. Yeah. Um, his uh, um, website. Okay, so just to clarify as well for our listeners, that is a 350 million aid package over four years, which is less than 100 million a year. Basically, chump change, to be honest. And, you know, regarding the prime minister's statement, there was a lot of hyping of this, both on public media, both in even pro-government, non-public media, about this event as if it was going to be uh, the deal of the century, sort of like the Armenian version of the deal of the century, or, you know, as, as I say, as I say in Armenian, Darak Azmik. But, you know, what, what are your impressions? Uh, so go ahead. I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, caveat to what you said. Yes, uh, if to pass to the uh, impact of this meeting for Armenia or the results of the meeting for Armenia, money that was given or the they promised to give the money to Armenia, it's uh, not as a big sum that uh, will change really something in Armenia because we uh, now already have like a package of 2.6 billion uh, euros promise for uh, years and only approximately 500 millions are already given to Armenia. And uh, besides that, uh, even the 270 millions uh, that are now promised to Armenia, it's not just a grant for doing what Armenia government wants to do, but it's like a grant for many projects that and many reforms that must be completed to get this money. It's like a money 
for a homework that must be done. And if I recall, most of it, most of the $2.6 billion were loan guarantees, not outright grants. Yeah. Yes. So only about $100 million of that was outright grants. So this is basically in the same ballpark. Yeah. But so a lot of the reading the announcement, a lot of the funds will go to food assistance, humanitarian protection and shelter. Nothing was talked about the rights of return for Artsakhsis and their, their other rights as well, the self-determination rights. Nothing was talked about Artsakhsis in general, just humanitarian protection. Um, and also a lot of, uh, it seems there, there will be a lot of grants for media type projects to counter disinformation and things like that. So I believe the Daniel Ionisian types will be very proud and happy of that. And sorry to interrupt Anna again, but this is really uh, <laughs> interesting. And I just want to, you know, there's, yeah, we can't stop talking about it. As Hovik mentioned, there are a lot of, um, when we are speaking about the interests of Armenia in this dialogue and this uh, meeting, if we take into account the announcements that were made, uh, that were made before the meeting and the joint announcement after the meeting, we really don't see anything about uh, the um, rights of people of Artsakh to return to their uh, houses. And But uh, instead of that, uh, von der Leyen made even announcement that this money will help to integrate uh, the people of Artsakh in Armenia, which shows that they are uh, playing the same game that Azerbaijan tries to play, saying that, okay, this page is closed, and now that speak about the humanitarian issues, their rights of integration, etc., etc., but not about the returning of these people to their houses. The second uh, great uh, expectation from the meeting was really some security guarantees that the Maybe uh, everyone understood that EU is was not going to give uh, real security guarantees because, as they announced, EU is not about security; it's about the economy. But uh, the, uh, that's why there was Blinken, and a lot of people uh, thought that the presence of Blinken in this meeting is uh, for guaranteeing some security to Armenia. But even in this case. We didn't have any public announcements about that. Uh, I don't say that maybe, okay, they spoke about it behind the closed doors, but they didn't make any announcement that will guarantee Armenia security. Uh, there were just some announcements about maybe including Armenia into some projects that would help Armenia to get uh, some use from European, some projects, etc. But it's not a real security guarantee. But at the same time, Blinken himself was speaking about Armenia making a choice. That means that this choice will make a new security challenges for Armenia. Everyone understands this and everyone understands that Armenia is now going to pay a new price for this choice, for choosing West, going to the West, and uh, that uh, we need some real, very real security guarantees to get to the West in this process. Yeah. Well, there are different reads on this aid package, of course. Some analysts think that because the West is using the Turkish Azeri language of corridor in pressuring Armenia to agree to opening Sunik for Azerbaijan, that this aid amounts to essentially an institutionalized bribe to the Armenian government to consent. What do you think of this perspective? Uh, there were, in the joint announcement, there was spoken about this Pashinyan's project of crossroads of peace, uh, that the main idea of this project is to get rid of Russia in the communication issues and to open the uh, communications not uh, based on the statement of November 10, but uh, by a new project. Uh, in general, I think everyone understands, and even the government of Armenia understands that uh, nowadays it's not realistic, but they made this uh, project to uh, help uh, West uh, encourage Armenia to go on on this project and to uh, make progress in the opening of communications uh, with Azerbaijan and Turkey. Uh, but we don't see any will by Azerbaijan and Turkey to go on in this project. Even uh, now, they don't even speak about the Zangezur corridor. 
for the last uh, weeks, months. And now Azerbaijan is uh, saying that, okay, we are not as interested in this project because we have some projects, uh, the, we have some corridor by Iran and now Armenia must be interested in giving us this corridor and open communication. But, but they flip up on that talk, right? Sometimes uh, we really see that there are maybe uh, slightly lower ranked Turkish politicians who say something about the Zankizur corridor being a must or even Azerbaijanis. And then the official language still says Iran, blah, blah, blah. But then we come around to understanding that this project, this vision has not been given up. Of course, it's not given up, but and we must uh, remember that, that this project is also included in the Shusha Declaration that mm -hmm. they announced, uh, that they signed and ratified in their parliament, and uh, they will make Armenia uh, try to make Armenia to give this corridor anyway, and uh, we see that the West doesn't have a real position in this issue nowadays, or uh, in, uh, at least they are not. Uh, making some strict announcements about this. The main purpose of West in uh, now is uh, just as soon as possible to have situation when the communications are open and Armenia doesn't have any problem with Turkey, with Azerbaijan, that's uh, just to uh, make the role of Russia minimal in this case. Because uh, when uh, Armenia doesn't have any conflicts with Turkey and Azerbaijan, in that case, uh, no Russian base is needed in uh, Armenia and no military presence of uh, Russia is needed in the region. The last thing I want to say about the meeting of April 5 is that we see that in many spheres, West uh, tries to help Armenia to get rid of the Russian influence and role, like also energy, like nuclear station even as you remember eu for many years was just making armenia to close metam or nuclear station but now uh, us and eu are suggesting armenia to build new stations and to renovate its nuclear power uh, and they are really interested in engaging in the energy uh, projects with armenia in communication projects and in all possible spheres when they can replace Russia for Armenia. Yeah, yeah. So in the context of all of this, why is Aliyev so pissed off about the meeting? What outcomes is he expecting that could be negative for Azerbaijan? I can say that Azerbaijan is playing uh, its own game. And uh, it's uh, playing not very bad because even Ali is for quite a long time very critical about the politics of the West, uh, of the announcements of the Western leaders. Even he was, uh, he didn't want to negotiate by the mediation of the West, but at least he went to the last meeting and in this situation he is gaining some dividends from this situation for example before the meeting of the april 5 uh, blinken called aliyev to assure him that there are no problems for him in this meeting and armenia will not get anything that will uh, look problematic for azerbaijan and von der Leyen called aliyev to say that okay we will continue to cooperate in the energy sphere and will increase our cooperation, etc., etc. And it looks like in this situation, Armenia is spoiling its connections with Russia to get uh, closer to the West and to get something from the West. And Azerbaijan at the same time is making some uh, critical announcements uh, about the West. Even in that situation, Azerbaijan also some dividends from the West, at the same time being the best friend of Russia in the region and getting the dividends from Russia. It looks like Aliyev is gaining anyway, and Armenia is getting more and more problems. Right. And of course, the Russians are not stupid in this context. They've warned Armenia about the aid package, and they've said that this aid package can be irresponsible and destructive for Armenia and that Armenia is following the example of Ukraine. What do you make of these, in my opinion, extremely dire warnings? Russia's politics is, I think, is not really effective in this situation because now we 
have a lot of anti-Russian emotions in the Armenian society after uh, September uh, 23, when Russian peacekeepers didn't stop what was going in Artsakh. And because of the announcements that made about Armenia and the Russian government is continuing to make these announcements. And uh, even reacting to the April 5 meeting, uh, Russia is uh, continues to threaten Armenian society is, uh, instead of uh, showing its real will to change uh, the situation, to be a real partner for Armenia. And in this situation, even uh, those people in Armenia who understand that going to the West only to the West and uh, making Russia our uh, enemy is not a good scenario for Armenia. And uh, anyway, Armenia, Russia is an important partner for Armenia. But even those people cannot speak loudly about Russia as a partner because Russian government now is not acting like a real partner and Russian representatives are not making announcements that you see that they see Armenian people as their partner and as their um there, we don't see any uh, positive uh, emotions even to the Armenian society not coming case right so meanwhile the talks with azerbaijan continue to be stalled mirzoyan stated over the weekend that there are two major sticking points between armenia and azerbaijan first azerbaijan does not recognize armenia's sovereignty per the 1991 almata declarations second azerbaijan is not interested in border delimitation based on those borders that Armenia claims are defined in the Almata Declaration. So what has the Pashinyan regime achieved in the 3.5 years of so-called negotiations with Azerbaijan so far? Anything that we can call substantive? Today, to add to the points that you mentioned, today the representative of the, of the MFA of Armenia, Ani Badalyan, announced that Armenia responded to the last package uh, given by Baku. Uh, showing that uh, anyway we have some dialogue and um, we have this escalation on the borders, but anyway, Armenia is for peace dialogue and Armenia is reacting to the package of the peaceful uh, resolution of the situation and dialogue with Azerbaijan. But uh, in this situation, we see that if you remember just a couple of months ago, I don't remember Arad Mirzan or Pashinyan announced that Azerbaijan gave back the package uh, where all the points were just crossed out. Uh, that meant that in general, we don't have any real progress in the negotiation. Because these negotiations started from a very, very bad point where Azerbaijan gave the, his uh, five principles that were completely announcing his interests and not taking into account Armenian interests in general. And this was the starting point of the negotiations. And the process showed that Armenian government didn't really succeed in any point to get some positive changes that will meet Armenian interests. And even we saw that when Armenian government was speaking about the rights of people of Artsakh and their security, the reaction of Azerbaijan was the blockade of Artsakh and the bombing of uh, people in Artsakh and make them to leave their houses, after which they uh, came to the uh, came and said, okay, this was the issue we yeah. couldn't agree about. The issue is now resolved. Now the issue is solved. Yes, that continued the negotiation. And even in this situation, when, when Armenian government agreed to continue the negotiations, which was really absurd to continue negotiations in this situation, Azerbaijan decided not to agree to the other points and to press Armenia to make new and new and new concessions. And the, I think this process will not end till Armenian government is ready to meet all the expectations of Azerbaijan and Turkey and to give something more, give more, give more, hoping that one day maybe Ali will stop. 
battalion will not stop, but uh, we will uh, lose everything. Yes, in fact, I think it is prudent to highlight the fact that the way that Azerbaijan chooses to resolve issues that are on the negotiating table is to use brute force. Uh, it's just and and it's uh, interesting how the West, for instance, now is taking that as uh, for granted and basically continues with the same line of thoughts. You know, no one is talking about Artsakh anymore. So, Anna. Somewhere along the line, after the 44-day war, the so-called negotiations became about Armenian territory rather than about Artsakh, as you mentioned. Even though the November 9, 2020 agreement said that all sides must stay on the line of contact, uh, Pashinyan essentially promised to give up a lot more and has already given up a lot more, including the Goris Kapan Highway, Karabachar Berzor, and of course Artsakh. And it is apparent now that he may have also promised to give sections of Tavush. <laughs> and every time that he also makes these promises, he says, oh, it's okay, we will rebuild, we will build alternative roads. Uh, we just have to remind our listeners that uh, when uh, Shurnuk happened, Pashinyan said that he would rebuild the 13 houses of the residents who lost, you know, whose village was split apart by that seeding of land. And so far, those houses haven't been built two years later. I will also remind that the Goris Kapan Highway that was seeded without any precedent, uh, based on a verbal understanding, apparently, has not been adequately rebuilt. Essentially, if you've traveled on the so-called alternate road, which is now the primary road uh, between Goris and Kapan, it is always in shambles, uh, covered with potholes, and every time they just seem to be putting on band-aids on that road that uh, come apart the next day. So on what basis is Pashinyan saying that the four villages are Azerbaijani territory? And, uh, you know, it also makes me worry about the other enclaves, which haven't been brought up so far, but Alan Simonian definitely shared a map that included them. So, you know, on what basis is Pashinyan agreeing to give these villages and enclaves up, especially when Azerbaijanis have not uh, agreed on the basis for uh, delimitation and demarcation? It's really very difficult to say on what basis uh, Pashinyan is saying that, because the same Pashinyan was at different times. Uh, he was speaking about different uh, maps, different years of the maps, and connecting in the issue of these uh, villages. There was time when he was speaking that uh, when we will start demarcation, uh, delimitation of the borders, maybe we can agree that we leave the villages that are now in Armenia and not claiming villages from Azerbaijan, not to make them more problems for each other, etc. And uh, nowadays we say that it's not about the basis and it's not about negotiation. It just, uh, it, his politics is just about meeting all the issues that Azerbaijan and Turkey are rising. And the main purpose of Azerbaijan nowadays is not this for villages. It's just to show the Armenian society that uh, they can gain anything they want. And in this case, Armenia, the problem, the most, the worst thing is that uh, Armenian government is not trying to secure its country or to say that, uh, okay, we will discuss this issue, but when we have some delimitation process, but instead of this, or when Azerbaijan will leave uh, the Armenian sovereign territory in Gerarkun, for example, or in Jermuk, etc., but instead of this, Armenian uh, government is trying to ensure its society that if we will not give these villages, we will have another war, and in this war, we will not be able to do anything. This message is the worst thing. And in this situation, it's not even important or what is the basis of this announcement of Pashinyan, because this message uh, tells Armenian society that Nobody and nothing will protect us. We don't have a state. We don't have an army. We don't have borders. We don't have anything. We are just people living here that must do everything Aliyev tells us to do. And our government just says, okay, be quiet and do what Aliyev says. 
this is, I think, the worst thing in this situation. Indeed. Now, can you tell us what is at stake with giving uh, away these territories? For instance, just one week ago, I traveled through that route uh, from Bert to to the village of Boskepar and even uh, and even beyond. And if you look at Google Maps, I think it crosses the border between Armenia and Azerbaijan, at least on Google Maps, uh, you know, at least three to five times. I forgot count, like, you know, depending on how you compare, actually five times, it seems. And what we're promising, it seems, are villages that claim to have been occupied by Azerbaijanis formerly. And therefore, these are part of Azerbaijan. But so... If Armenia gives those uh, territories, then Azerbaijan is going to move very close to that strategic road. And as I said, it will also take over some parts of that road. Um, so I, we know that at least the communication on that strategic north-south highway uh, that connects Iran to Georgia would be impacted. Um, can you tell us what else would you know potentially be impacted with this if those villages are given away? And also... How about the enclaves? No one is talking about enclaves, but it seems like the Armenian government is saying that here are the maps uh, during the Almata, and at least you know from a Facebook post by Alan Simonian, he shared a map that uh, lists Voskepar uh, um, or Verin Voskepar, and essentially it, it it shows the enclaves in that map. So essentially, is the Armenian government also promising to give those enclaves to Azerbaijan? And is that basically the next thing that we're going to be witnessing once as, uh, Armenians give away those uh, non-enclave villages? Now they're going to talk about enclaves. Uh, when we speak about what are the problems of uh, giving these four villages, there are uh, a lot of problems. The first of all is, of course, security and the security of the road. And Pashinyan already spoke about the need to uh, have a new road and to build a new road to these villages that will not cross the Azerbaijani border. Uh, the second thing is the security of the people living in these villages. And it's obvious that these people will not be able to live there for a long time. Uh, it's just uh, to remember what we had in uh, Shurnuk and other villages that where the Azerbaijani bo- uh, army came and get settled near their villages. Split the village in half. In fact, like one of the houses was split right in the middle. And I just want to also remind yes. you that Armenian government promised to build 13 new houses for the village for the villagers who lost their homes because of that split. And two years later, those houses have not been built. And also, they promised to build a bypass road to the Goriskapan Highway. And the status of that bypass road is also abysmal. So it's nothing to compare to what we had for the Goriskapan Road. So I'm really worried that if it seems like the the handover of these areas is imminent as in in the next weeks in the next month meanwhile building roads takes a, you know multiple months at least a year, you know maybe even a year so are we going to be in the same situation where people are going to be using uh, villages through the forest you know roads through the forest or some back roads uh, as a replacement for a functioning uh, highway um, I think that maybe why not? Uh, because we don't see that anything is done now not to let this situation happen. And the sec- uh, the, uh, the other thing is the psychological problems for the people living there because uh, the main uh, purpose of Azerbaijan is to play on the nerves of the Armenian society. In any situations, it's uh, not important the way to do this. It's like uh, Aliyev making some speeches or fires in the uh, square in Stepanakert and showing this to Armenian society or uh, announcing in the villages of Shurnuk like that uh, it's not your house, you should go out, it's our uh, house and turning on some Azerbaijani music, etc., etc., just to play on the nerves of people uh, living there. Maybe we will have the same situation here when people will just decide to leave these villages and not to uh, live in this nervous situation side by side with Azerbaijani army. And uh, the thing is that these villages and these were very important positions uh, 
in military purposes for Armenia for a long time. And uh, now uh, the main thing of giving these villages is not just a territory, but is losing this uh, position in case of a new conflict that will uh, make Armenia even more weak in uh, possible conflict and uh, make uh, more problems for Armenia in this situation. I, let me also state that according to various uh, interviews that I have followed, uh, including Tigran Abrahamian, member of parliament, basically the Tavush uh, line of contact is the most fortified line of contact between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And that's the line of contact that has not been altered as a result of the 2020 war or even beyond. And there is claim by experts such as Abrahamian that uh, any change in those lines would essentially uh, create weaknesses in our defensive lines and allow for a potential breakthrough in the future if Azerbaijan decides to invade Armenia from, from those areas. Can you t- talk a little bit about that as well? Uh, I'm not a military expert to say more than it's already said by the experts in this issue. But issues, but yes, we saw the uh, we during years that Tavush was a very strong military line for Armenia, and we uh, now this losing this positions will change the situation and also we had uh, before this we had some issues connected to uh, Grigory Khachatov if i am not mistaken who is also who was also uh, the responsible for this military line of Tabush for quite a long time and he was quite effective in this issue and we see that this government is building its uh, policy in the way that uh, saying that today's situation, today's their messages uh, shows us that these positions will not change anything because if we have a war, our army will will not be able to stop Azerbaijan, and that means that these positions it's better to give these positions than to have a new war. And that's why this situation, I think, is very problematic for Armenia and gives a very bad messages uh, to Armenian society and weakens Armenian society in case of a new conflict. Okay, uh, let's talk just a little bit about the relations with Russia, which to me seem like they are in a free fall. Every week we think that the Russian-Armenian relations have hit a rock bottom. It turns out that it was just a new low. This week, the Armenian government banned the Russia One television station in Armenia for offensive political content. A couple of weeks ago, Pashinyan asked the Russian border guards to leave Zavartnot's airport, so that date is now set for August 1st. Now there's escalating talk about the Russian border guards around Armenia and also the base in Gyumri. The Russian MFA has warned that Russian military presence in Armenia is the only real guarantee of Armenia's sovereignty and that relations between the two countries are on the verge of collapse. Anna, can you summarize the current state of this relationship and where it's headed? Uh, It's really difficult to speak about the relations of Armenia and Russia today because it's like more a conflict of announcements than real relations because uh, we see that the Armenian government by its side uh, does everything to worsen these relations and to reach a point when uh, nothing will be able to uh, be changed in the process of uh, making Russia to leave Armenia and leave the region. And by the Russian side, we see that their announcements are getting more and more tough every time. And Zaharva is making every week like uh, new and new announcements where, where they speak very uh, rude even uh, about the government of Armenia and their policy. And uh, the problem is that, yes, uh, we see what uh, Armenian government is doing, but at the same time, Armenia is not just the government, and Armenia is Armenian people, and for a very long time, Armenian people is thinking of Russia, of Russian people as their partners, as their 
allies and uh, now this e these emotions are very difficult for Armenian people and this new situation is very difficult and has a lot of risks for Armenia because uh, yes we understand that security system that was mainly uh, built uh, on Ra Armenian Russian relations is not very good and it doesn't work very well and uh, maybe it will not well in case we have a new conflict where Armenia will directly be involved but today is the only security system we have and the west is uh, doesn't keep or suggest Armenia any security guarantees and anything in the sphere of security except a civil mission that can just go and see uh, how the situation is going and make some announcements. But announcements, uh, we had a lot of announcements during the war of 2020, we had a lot of announcements in 2023, but this didn't uh, change the situation for Armenia and for Artsakh. So are the Russian border guards a hurdle for Armenia in its efforts to ramp up military cooperation with Western countries, the US, the EU, NATO, or even India? I think that... Um... I'm just kind of looking for a reason why Armenia is suddenly interested in these border guard discussions and removals and what have you right now. I think this is just one of the points of pushing away uh, Russia and minimizing the Russian military presence in the region. It's not just it's not the crucial issue for Armenia, but it's an issue showing the real policy that is uh, made by the government of, uh, of Armenia and the West is maybe that is uh, it's what West is expecting Pashinyan to do. At the same time, we see that Armenia is uh, trying to have some uh, military cooperation with India, with France, and uh, involving new partners. But this is just about uh, buying some equipment and buying some weapons, etc. It's not about uh, building a new security system in general. And with Russia, there is not just uh, Armenia buying some weapons. Uh, it's uh, uh, some uh, general security system that was established during long years and that was thought to uh, secure Armenia in the region. I don't know how it works today, but anyway, we don't have any real alternative today. Mm. A couple of weeks ago, Armenian banks cut off the Russian credit cards from their processing system. Why would they do that? And what were, I mean, what are going to be the consequences for such a move, especially on the remittances from Russia and also the tourism that comes from Russia? Because, you know, uh, Armenian economy really gained from the sanctions against Russia because not announced, but Armenia as a member of the Eurasian Union really uh, helped uh, Russia or Russian citizens to overcome some sanctions and etc. etc. and a lot of Russian money flits to Armenian economy. And because, uh, and of course, uh, European partners of Armenia see this, understand what's going on. And that's one we had even the Sullivan's visit to uh, Armenia and uh, announcements that Armenia must join, uh, even if not join the sanctions, but not help Russia to uh, overcome these sanctions. And uh, this point was also in the announcements of uh, April 5, when they appreciated the will of Armenia to help uh, West uh, in the issues of sanctions. And I think that uh, this issue of the card mirror is something that was told by the West uh, to Armenia to be done. And of course, uh, Armenia's government understands that it will uh, if, uh, have a bad effect on the economy of, Arme of Armenia, but it is the price he is paying for the results uh, he wants to have from this. Yes. In fact, I was wondering about that because a, a significant portion of the, what was it, the 12 or 13% economic growth was the re-exports 
of Western stuff to Russia. And now that's going to diminish quite extensively. So the economic growth will be much lower than expected at this point. And just quickly in the few minutes that we have left, of course, the Russians are not the only people Pashinyan is having a war of words with. In the middle of March, hundreds of Artsakh Tsis demonstrated in Yerevan because uh, the government has not been allocating necessary aid, but more specifically, it hasn't been seeking or pursuing their right of return to their homeland. Artsakh President Samvesh Aramanyan confirmed that the declaration of the dissolution of the Artsakh government has no merit or basis, and that his government continues uh, to exist in exile. That made Pashinyan very angry, and Pashinyan warned that such statements serve Russian interests and they threaten the security of Armenia, the national security of Armenia. Uh, so, And also Artsakh Beglarian, a former state minister of Artsakh, correctly stated that Pashinyan is threatening the Artsakh leadership and no actions against them can be excluded. Um, first, let's not forget that there are 150,000 Artsakh refugees in Armenia, a result of 3.5 years of forced ethnic cleansing by Azerbaijan. And uh, can you talk a little bit about their condition and why, you know, is Pashinyan so adamant to silence the Artsakh leadership? Is there um, anything that we missed uh, in terms of qualifying that uh, behavior? Mm. Uh, speaking about this, their situation, there are a lot of unsolved humanitarian issues till today. And people from Artsakh are not really happy about the policies that the Armenian government decided to have work, uh, in the issues that are connected to them because the main purpose of the Armenian government is to make these people to take the uh, citizenship of Armenia. And uh, the announcement, the interesting announcement Pashinyan made was that we are not going just to make the programs for the people uh, from Artsakh, but we must make these people our ordinary citizens and make programs, uh, social programs for general Armenian people who need these programs. It means that uh, Armenian government is trying to use the money that they got from the world to help the people of Artsakh to first integrate these people and not uh, let them again speak about their rights of returning to Artsakh, etc. And the second, to also spend this money on the social problems of population of Armenia that are his main electorate that will vote for him. And uh, of course, the uh, but the people of Artsakh uh, are not uh, happy with these decisions and uh, they uh, see a lot of problems. They speak about these problems. And uh, the second thing is that they uh, just keep their hope that they will have a chance to return to their houses and their rights uh, will be secured, guaranteed. And in this case, their institutions have some, uh, no matter they love what uh, Shahra Manyan does or no, but they uh, give some importance to their institutions. And uh, the policy of Armenian government uh, to just uh, close these institutions or are, of course, are problematic for these people. And uh, they speak, try to speak about this. Why Pashinyan does this? Because his policy is that the conflict of Artsakh is closed, the issue of Artsakh is closed, and we must not return to this issue. It means that um, uh, the people of Artsakh must be as soon as possible integrated to Armenian society. They must not have their institutions that will speak about their sovereignty and their rights of returning to uh, Artsakh. And uh, that's why he is doing this. And uh, he is saying that the these uh, institutions and uh, the announcements of these people are uh, uh, some threat for Armenian security. That is just uh, absurd. And it's that's what Aliyev wants uh, to listen like. All right. In the interest of time, let's wrap up our topics here. Let me ask each of you if there's something on your mind that you would like to share. Hovig? Well, the only thing I would like to share is that we recently 
interviewed Marcus Ritter, the head of the EU monitoring mission in Armenia. It was an interesting discussion. Uh, go listen to it if you'd like. But, um, you know, we've had three days of shooting reported by both sides, uh, especially, you know, Armenia uh, on all sides of the Azerbaijani Armenian border. And what we're seeing is essentially the Armenians claim that Azerbaijanis sh shoot at night. Meanwhile, the next day, during daytime, the EU monitoring mission goes happily along the villages, says hi to the villagers, uh, records no shots fired, and claims that uh, you know there are no troop movements. Uh, and that leads EU officials to say that everything is stable and the sides are essentially lying. And I don't think the Armenian government is lying. There are ev evidences of shots being fired and civilian property being damaged. So I have to question the you know purpose and effectiveness of the EU monitoring mission at this stage. Uh, are they here to simply um, pacify people's concerns while Azerbaijan just attacks Armenia? Uh, and what exactly is their mission? Or are they just here for PR? And whose PR? Azerbaijan's or EU's? So um, yeah, I'm not. Uh, you know, I have a lot of questions uh, to the EU monitoring mission. Uh, and I have had several questions as a follow-up for an interview that we did for them. Uh, but they said that due to duty of care and due to of you know questions that we were asking were of security uh, nature that they would not be able to answer them. So there we have that. Okay, Anna, what's on your mind? Today we have the president of PASE in Armenia and Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe. And uh, before that, we had the general secretary of uh, NATO in the region, uh, in Baku and then in uh, Yerevan. And uh, then was April 5 meeting when, and the idea I was thinking about that now the West is like compromising its values for its interests when the general secretary of NATO uh, goes to Baku and speaks about the, some different issues and not uh, speaking about the just the presidential elections that took place in the awful presidential elections that took place in Azerbaijan like a month ago. And when heads of European structures that are uh, responsible for democracy are speaking about the very good progress in Armenian democracy, not seeing the fact that at the same time Armenia has some political prisoners and that, for example, just some weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, the speakers of Ar one of Armenian podcasts that were criticizing Armenian government were rudely imprisoned. And Narek this, Samsonian. And uh, Vazgen Zagatelia. And uh, when our, uh, European representatives don't speak about these things and they just mention that they are with Pashinyan and with our Armenian democracy, this means that they are really compromising their values for their interests just because Pashinyan really is ready to help them to push away Russia from the region and in this case he can do anything. And I think that this is really not very good for Armenia and Armenian democracy because it means that it opens hands for Armenian government to do anything to people who are criticizing them and who don't agree with their policy. And this is uh, some kind of issue of security for Armenia in general. Very important thoughts on both of your parts. Thank you so much for sharing those. Thank Let's you. leave it there for today. Thank you, Anna, for joining us. Bye, Anna. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. That was our Week in Review show recorded on April 8, 2024. We've been talking with Dr. Anna Garabedian, who is the director of the Insight Analytical Center for Applied Policy and Research. She has a PhD in political sciences and is a lecturer at the Russian Armenian University. I'm Aspet Bedrosian. And this is Hovik Manucharyan. Please follow us on social media and follow us everywhere you get your Armenian news. The links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon.